Welcome. Welcome to Lincoln Square Presbyterian Church's online worship for July 19th. As we gather here, we do so trusting that God is the one who has called us to come and worship, the one who's created us and redeemed us in Christ and called us to respond. And so as we get ready to worship, uh, I encourage you to take a moment to uh, respond by passing the peace of Christ if you're worshiping with others or to offer a prayer or send a text uh, to a brother or sister in Christ. Also, to remember to give to the work of the church. And I want to highlight in particular, again, the Benevolence Fund to remind you that that fund is there that you can give to to support the work of the church as we help neighbors or help congregants with needs. And also, if you have a need, to please don't hesitate to reach out to the church office or to the deacons about that fund. A couple other quick announcements. Uh, one right now, Kids Week uh, is online. We're doing our summer camp online, and it's available. So if you have questions or want more information, you can contact the church office. Uh, there is Zoom meetings on Sunday mornings at 1030, lessons for kids. It's a lot of fun. So I encourage you, if you haven't accessed that, to, to do so. Also, uh, I want to remind you to keep an eye out on our website for the tab, Ways to Worship. Uh, we're continuing to kind of work through plans to gather uh, 50 or less, hopefully the first Sunday of August in a new location. So there'll be information uh, sent by email, but also on our website. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 139, and instead of singing, we'll be reading a responsive call. But before we come and do that, take a moment of quiet to prepare ourselves to come before God. I invite you to join with me in this call to worship from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Good morning. Please feel free to sing along with me at home. Glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms. 
ransoms with life that shall endless be. Um, I will now lead us <clears throat> in a time of prayer. As I do so, I encourage you to take a moment to think about your needs, your worries, your desires. Um, and if you're worshiping with other people, I encourage you to check in with one another. I will conclude our time of prayer with a time of quiet for you to bring your own requests and confessions to God. But let us pray. Lord, we come before you longing for your presence aching to know the rest that is only to be found in you. We confess that we feel many of the foundations of our lives being shaken, things we have long counted on, such as work and school are no longer assured. From the cracks of those foundations, we feel fear emerge. Fear for our bodies in the face of COVID-19 that continues to spread and kill, but also fear of many diseases, accidents, violence that continues to plague our families, friends, communities, and the world. Fear that the futures we imagined for ourselves, our children, our communities won't come to fruition. Fear that things will never be the same. Lord, this morning we acknowledge those fears and we bring them to you. Confident your grace is sufficient. Confident because your son, the firstborn of all creation, has dwelt among us taking on our flesh, knowing our deepest fears, and that by his faithfulness, we are your children. So we bring our fears to you that we may hide them in you, hide them in the shadow of the cross, in the love that was poured out for us. Sanctify our fears and free us to see our brothers and sisters and love them in action and truth. Free us that we may truly love our enemies and long for their good because we know that you are a loving, generous, and gracious Father. Lord, encourage us by the example of your Son to offer up our cries and tears, groans, whatever they may be, to you in prayer and supplication, that you may strengthen us as your family, one holy family, so that we may say together with our Savior, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, LSPC. We miss you. We do miss you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear from you all. We're so pleased to be able to add this to your service. We're still here in England doing well and working at Labrie. We hope you all are doing well and surviving in these strange times that we're having. Here's the word of the Lord, the Old Testament reading from Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. The New Testament lesson is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him 
in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. <laughs> For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan, and, groan inwardly as we, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm thankful for a chance to look at God's word with you today to worship together. Um, this summer we have been looking at the Gospel of John. And we're going to continue that series today. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 4, verse 27 through 42. One resource describes John's Gospel as a book of conversations. A book of conversations. And in chapter 3, we took a couple Sundays to look at Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, a religious leader. Now we're going to take a couple of Sundays, we're in the middle of that, to look at his conversation with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. Last week we looked at the beginning of this encounter, and while we don't know her whole story or learn her name, we do see Jesus cross cultural and social lines to enter into a conversation with her. He not only speaks with her, but receives her questions and invites her to become part of his people. So today we will see the response to this conversation, the response of Jesus' disciples, the response of the Samaritan woman, and the response of her neighbors. So let's look at our passage, John 4, verse 27 through 42. You can follow along uh, or in your Bible or just listen as I read. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out to the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. This is God's word given for our good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for speaking your truth to us. We ask that your spirit would be present as we study and consider your word, that 
you may use it to bring life to our bodies, that you may lift our heads to find grace and hope in our shame, and that we may walk in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the sermon will have two parts uh, today. The first part, I want us to remember or to see the context of this encounter, this conversation. So we'll briefly look at the context, then we'll spend the rest of our time in the second part looking at the response. What is the response of Jesus' disciples, the Samaritan woman, and her neighbors? So let's start by thinking of the context and see how our passage begins. Jesus' disciples had gone into the city to buy food while he rested at the well. We read that as they return from their shopping trip, they marvel that Jesus is talking with a woman. They are surprised, but no one says out loud, why are you talking to her? Well, their surprise over Jesus engaging this Samaritan woman in conversation is an opportunity for us to ask again or to remember the context of what's going on here. See, Jesus is walking north. He's taking the long trip back to Galilee, and he's wearied from his journey. He stops and sits beside a well outside Samaria, a Samaritan town called Sychar. Jesus, the eternal word in flesh, shows his connection to us, shows his genuine humanity, and that he grew tired. Weary from travel, thirsty in the heat of midday. He rests while the disciples go into town, and as he waits, a woman from Samaria comes out to the well to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus says. How is it that you, a Jewish man, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? It's as if she is basically saying to Jesus, why, why are you talking to me? You see, when Jesus engages this unnamed Samaritan woman in conversation, he is stepping over a number of cultural and social lines. It's surprising to his disciples and it's surprising even to this woman. And so I want to real quickly mention or remind us of, of three things that set this as shocking to those who are witnessing it. First, Samaritans were viewed by Jews as defiled, as compromisers of the faith. There was historic hostility between the two groups, such that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Second, <clears throat> it was not uncommon for religious leaders or holy men to refuse to be alone with a woman, or if they were in the company of a woman, to not enter into conversation with her. And the third thing for us to note is that this woman is an outcast within her own community. She comes to the well by herself in the heat of the day to avoid others, to avoid the shame, the gossip, the harsh words of her neighbors. Jesus knows about this woman's past, her multiple partners and circumstances. He knows that she is an outcast in her own town. Jesus knows these three points of separation that I mentioned, yet he engages this outcast Samaritan woman in conversation. He intentionally steps over boundaries, disrupts lines in order to address, to listen to, to teach, and invite this woman. And in fact, the conversation ends with Jesus revealing his identity to her in a direct manner. She says, you know, when the Messiah comes, he'll explain everything. He'll explain what we don't understand. Jesus' response to this is, I am he. I am he. Well, having set the context, then we can ask this other question of what is the response to those who witness or participate in the conversation? What's the response of the Samaritan woman, the disciples, the woman's neighbors, and, and what can we learn from their response? Well, the disciples return, that's how our passage begins. They return from their shopping, and it brings the conversation to an end. You know, they return, and the Samaritan woman leaves to go tell her neighbors about her experience. If she had avoided the company of her neighbors before, she is now a changed person. She seeks them out and shares the news with them. She is surprised and she is certainly confused by Jesus, 
but she is also moved. And so she goes with a message. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Come and see. And as she returns to her neighbors, what about the disciples? Well, as I mentioned, they are shocked. They're shocked, but rather than speak about this out loud to Jesus, they speak about food. (laughs) Rabbi, eat. I have food to eat that you do not know about, says Jesus. Has anyone brought him something to eat? What is he talking about? There is a parallel here between Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman about thirst and living water and this conversation with his disciples about food and hunger. Just as the woman misunderstood Jesus' words about living water and and misunderstood them in a material sense, so the disciples now misunderstand too. Has, Has someone given him food? Jesus, knowing the shock his disciples felt, knowing how they were responding to his conversation with this woman. Jesus is intentionally raising a question for them. And it's a question not just for them, but for us as well. It's the question of satisfaction, the question of wholeness. Where is it found? Where is it found? Tired and thirsty though he was, hungry though he was, Jesus has been refreshed. Do you see it? Jesus has been refreshed by the opportunity of imparting spiritual help, sharing good news with this woman. Jesus once again uses a common item, food, and a common experience, hunger, to teach about God and God's work in him. I have food to eat that you do not know about. During the quarantine, I saw an article that I thought was interesting. It was titled, Love Letters to Restaurants. Love Letters to Restaurants. In the article, it read, restaurants are about much more than food. We didn't just lose places to be fed. We lost a theater of experience. The article invites writers to pen love letters to restaurants that they're missing or to Remember past experiences while they were out to eat. One writer mentions her favorite spot and the large margaritas that they had. Another remembers the endless list of cheesecakes at the Cheesecake Factory. And another one remembers growing up and going out to eat with her grandmother at Red Lobster. (laughs) This writer, she pens, She writes how a biscuit, how a biscuit from Red Lobster taught her why her grandmother used to stuff the contents of complimentary bread baskets into her foil lined purse. Love letters to restaurants. We didn't just lose a place to be fed, but a theater of experience. The article is pointing out that food is always about more than food. Food is always about more than food. And we see that when Jesus says, I have food that you do not know about. And these words from Jesus evoke uh, a line from Deuteronomy that he quotes in the wilderness. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. (laughs) You remember in in the biblical story of creation, humans are presented as hungry. Humans must eat in order to live. But the hunger within us goes beyond food. The cycle of hunger and food points to a deeper longing, a deeper desire. And what the creation story says and what we see through scripture and see here in Jesus is our hunger points to the fact that we were made by and for God, the giver of life, the giver of food, of all good things. I have food that you do not know about. Man does not live by bread alone. See, humans are presented as hungry, but our story also includes the reality that we have forgotten. We have forgotten that this need, this desire, ultimately points to God, points beyond, points to a deeper desire. 
In the story of fallen humanity, instead of directing our hunger to the giver of all good things, we direct our hunger at objects or at people. And we know what happens in these scenarios. What happens in this fallen state is that such directing fills us with anger, leaves us unsatisfied, leaves us separated in ourselves and from others. Last Sunday, I mentioned C.S. Lewis's children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. In it, one of the children becomes enchanted or entrapped by the evil white witch when she feeds him Turkish delight, a confection made of nuts and syrup. In the story, Edmund is hungry, he's lost, he's tired and cold. He gives his hunger to this Turkish delight. And this consuming reduces him. It addicts him, leaves a deeper hunger, leads to him lying, deceiving, and betraying his brother and sisters. But that's not the whole story of that book. Later on in the book, Aslan the great lion, the Christ figure, rescues and restores Edmund. Aslan, the strong lion, willingly in love, takes Edmund's sin and guilt upon himself. The great lion takes all the separation, takes the place of a liar, a betrayer, an addict, so that he may grant forgiveness and release to him. Grant new life, a new beginning. And what that book does so wonderfully is it shows not only does he grant Edmund forgiveness and a new beginning, but Aslan calls Edmund to join his mission to represent him, to be one of his people. This food, this food in the book Aslan, but the food of God, gives Edmund courage even to face the white witch, courage to fight for his brother and sisters. We're invited to think about here is living water. Here is the food that Jesus speaks about. And it is the food of God's grace in Christ. A food that not only satisfies our deepest hunger, but gives us the joy of forgiveness. The new beginning of a new identity. The spirit at work in us to help us walk in new ways. To have courage or to have a purpose we didn't have before. Jesus uses the disciples' response. He uses it as a chance to invite us to think again about our hunger and how it's meant in its very depth to remind us of our Creator. You see what Jesus says, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me. One does not live by bread alone, though we often try to do so. After referring to food and hunger, Jesus invites his disciples to join him, to eat this food of God, to do his will, in particular, to join him in the work of mission and being a blessing to others. You see, in our passage, Jesus uses two agricultural sayings to to kind of compel his disciples to join him, to seek the food that he has. First, another four months, then it's harvest time. He's saying, "Don't, don't say this, don't wait. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest now. See all who are hungry, who are all who are ready for real and lasting food. As Jesus at first is saying to his disciples, don't delay. The harvest is now. Go. And the second saying that he references is one sows and another reaps. He says, this is true. Look, the sowers have done their work and you are now the reapers. Others have given witness God's long story, God's grace, his covenant promise. You did not do all this planting, but you are now here to enjoy the harvest, the fruit. The point that Jesus is making is that in him, in him the moment has come. Now is the time to call all, all people across all lines to direct their hunger to him, to eat the food that he has and to find satisfaction. The question we've been asking is, what is the response? And this brings us back, as we think about Jesus' call to his disciples, it brings us back to the response of the Samaritan woman and her neighbors. 
Do you see, as Jesus explains these things, that it's the unlikely midday conversation with a surprised and outcast woman that here, here is a harvest of joy and faith and life. Jesus is filled with excitement at what has just happened. He is filled as he sees the gospel flow over lines, break divisions, form a new family. A, a Jewish man has been invited to stay in the town of Samaria. He's filled as he sees it change the way neighbors relate to one another, changes identities. Here, an unclean, outcast woman is now declared a daughter of God, blessed and a blessing to others. In his book, The Missionary Movement in Christian History, the author Andrew Walls explores the, the mission of God, explores how God's spirit works within us. And one of the things that he says that I have found helpful, he says that we all have different questions, different places in which we feel the thirst and hunger in our being. But to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ is to come to the same conclusion that whatever our questions are, whatever our hunger or thirst, the answer rests in Christ. The answer rests in Jesus and what he has to offer. I need to eat the food that Jesus has. I need to eat the food that he offers. And from the woman's point of view, her main presentation of Jesus is, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. He told me what I have done. And you hear the answer that she found in Jesus, an outcast within an outcast community. Here is someone who knows me, who knows all that I've ever done, yet he receives me and he offers me the gift of life and a new beginning. Here's a woman who, as a matter of an hour before, had been trapped in a life of immorality, a social outcast, no way backward or forward. And all she could do was make sure she went to the well at a time when no one else would be there. But now she has become the first evangelist to the Samaritan people. Before any of Jesus' own disciples could do it, she has told them that here is the Christ. Come and see for yourselves. Here is a picture picture of living water in which this woman has received from Jesus. This living water overflowing, an overflowing fountain that others are now coming to share the refreshment and blessing. And they go and they see. And what do they conclude? What's their response? Here is the Savior of the world. The Gospel of John shows us numerous conversations, a book of conversations, and often people misunderstand Jesus and misunderstand what he is saying, but there are times when people see clearly. Something breaks through the Spirit as at work to open people's eyes and move them to faith, to be born anew, to taste living water, food that satisfies. And here is such an example. An unlikely group called by an unlikely messenger. But they offer a conclusion, they offer a statement of faith in their hospitality and their words that could be a summary of John's whole gospel. God sent his son into the world in order that the world might be saved through him. Here is the savior of the world. We are offered these responses to Jesus' ministry, offered to know this blessing ourselves and him and call to share it with our neighbors. Let's go and do so. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are, a God that oversteps bounds and breaks down walls, a God whose message goes forth flowing into places even of brokenness and compromise. We pray that that would be true in our lives, that the living fountain of your spirit would be overflowing within us, not only to bless us, but to be a blessing to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Restore us, so Lord. Restore us, so Lord. Although we are weeping, Lord, help us keep sowing the seeds of your kingdom. Receive now God's blessing. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.